All right, let's get started. So uh, last time we ended unit one with this sort of conceptual diagram that was supposed to capture the, the various forces and the dynamics behind genetic algorithms. And so um, this uh, was sort of what I uh, scribbled on the board, but this is kind of the, the nicer typeset version of it where we said, well, in all of these, and actually most evolutionary algorithms, as we'll see today as we kind of extend and go beyond the GA, uh, there is going to be some diversity in fitness which corresponds to selection pressure. If you have things that have a wide variety of fitnesses, then that means that gradually over time, the ones with higher fitness are gonna become a larger bit of the, of the population, um, at least if you're at high diversity. But if you're at a low diversity in fitness, then even ones that have a high fitness uh, may not actually end up dominating in the end. Uh, because if you're um, in this region where drift dominates, in other words, where the size of your population becomes so small that it's unlikely or it's more likely to you, for you to select unfit solutions than fit solutions, then your selection pressure kind of doesn't matter so much because you're kind of dominated by drift. But in this area where you've got high selection pressure, you might have a low genotypic diversity, so every solution is very similar or high genotypic diversity where every solution is very different. And so if you're in the high uh, diversity um, uh, regime, the high genotypic diversity, you're basically in an exploration mode. So right now you're, you're moving over the, the decision space and you're trying a bunch of different things out. But as you shift down then to where the genotypes are very similar but their fitnesses are very different, then you're in exploitation mode where you've identified an interesting area of the decision space and now you just want to optimize within that. So ideally, for a static optimization problem, for a problem where there is a fitness objective that is fixed ahead of time and doesn't change over the, the dynamics of the genetic algorithm or the evolutionary approach, then you'd like to start up here with high diversity population <coughs> and then move in this sort of direction. So hopefully then uh, over time, if you've got a well-designed genetic algorithm, then you'll find a good spot in the space that's better than all the other spots. Everyone will converge there, and then you'll start exploiting and optimizing those. But ultimately, uh, because selection moves you toward the drifty area as well as drift, then you're gonna get stuck at stagnation. And so, you can put mutation in to delay that, but the more mutation you put in, the more you kind of have this natural force away from exploitation. So exploitation is all about increasing the precision of your search. So you can say that one way to deal with drift is to add mutation, but adding mutation is going to mean that it's going to prevent you from living that much in this exploitation space. So there's kind of a, a speed precision trade-off here where if you want to work with small population sizes, you're going to have high drift. And so the only way you can push yourself over into this region where selection pressure dominates is to add high mutation. But the cost of that is you'll, you probably won't get to exploit very much. So you want to have you know, high precision solutions. So if you really need those high precision solutions, then you'd like to back off the mutation, but the only way a genetic algorithm will work by backing off the mutation is by working at very large population sizes. For us, a large population size means you've got many parallel searches going on, each one of them evaluating that costly fitness objective. So you have to pay that computational cost of evaluating the objective more in parallel. So that's what I mean by it's kind of a speed accuracy trade-off and that if you um, have the, the, the computational time, you can use huge populations and you'll get high precision solutions. But if you don't have the computational time, you have to limit your population size, which probably means you're gonna have to increase something like mutation, which probably means you'll get a good solution, but maybe not a very, you know, uh, you might miss out on some easy optimizations. So that's kind of the conceptual framework that we have here. There's a question? Yeah. So what kind of a place is it when we have more diversity in fitness, but there isn't diversity in genotype? That's down here. So this genotype is this axis, and this the diversity in fitness is this axis. So if you have low genotype diversity, but high fitness diversity, 
that I'm calling that that's kind of the exploitation regime. The diversity in fitness means that selection pressure dominates, but the lack of diversity in genotype means that you're stuck exploiting, in other words, fine tuning. So this, by exploitation, another term we could use there is fine tuning. Whereas up here, um, you know, this is sort of the coarse search, C-O-A-R. So you get, uh, you know, coarse searches up this way and fine tuning down this way. Like, I cannot think of the situation where we have this, like, when we have more genotype, it's only when we have more fitness options, right? Like, more variety. Not necessarily. You can have, uh, you can have, <coughs> if uh, you have a fitness object, or a, yeah, I'll say a, an optimization objective. that has multiple peaks, and some of them are quite sharp, then you can have solutions that in genotype space are just in this tiny region of X. And that tiny region of X projects up into maybe a large region of fitness. So here we have a small, genotypic diversity, but we have a large fitness diversity. And so we're stuck in this peak. So we can't optimize within this peak, but if this isn't a good peak to be in, then we're never gonna find these other peaks because we're stuck over here. All right, any other questions about this basic framework? I mentioned this framework because you, if um, in a class like this, you potentially may someday have to write your own genetic algorithm um, or something that's inspired by these methods. And so you then will be making the choices of selection, crossover, and mutation. And so we mentioned that you know, there are these three basic uh, common selection, uh, which you know, we say fitness, proportionate, we had uh, rank-based or rank-proportionate, and then we had the tournament. And then over in crossover, we gave examples of one point, uh, two point, or just multi-point. And then we gave examples of um, uniform crossover operations. And then for computational complexity, you might not like you know, having to deal with all this encoding just to do crossover. So you could imagine simplifying these things with using something like convex combinations. In other words, you could imagine taking um, a gene in the next generation to be the previous value of the gene for one individual, called an individual A, gene I times alpha, plus um, individual B at gene I times one minus alpha, where this alpha maybe is drawn from a uh, uniformly distributed, uh, uh, from uniform distribution from zero to one. So this might be like a version of uniform crossover, but instead of dealing with swapping encodings, you're just basically taking a weighted average of a gene from one parent and a gene from the other parent. You can imagine doing this with the entire chromosome, where you take uh, the whole chromosome from one parent and you either do this per gene or maybe you just do it the whole chromosome. Treat the chromosome as one big number and then do this kind of interpolating between chromosomes. So this is one way to uh, reduce the computational complexity of dealing with keeping track of all of this crazy encoding and doing this swapping. But it's all still in the spirit of crossover. And then uh, under mutation, we talked about how uh, there's a bunch of different ways you can do uh, mutation. Um, I mentioned two last time, uniform and non-uniform, where basically I was saying that in uniform, you just apply the same mutation probability to all genes. Uh, in non-uniform, then maybe you do something a little more exotic where you do uh, a, a higher mutation rate early and a lower mutation rate later. So there's a lot of choices you can have to make here. And my hope is that if you can wrap your head around a, a conceptual framework like this one, it helps you understand where you're moving in, uh, in this choice space. Yeah, question? I was wondering, 
Yeah, so you certainly could build a genetic algorithm where you had, you know, sex among multiple, you know, more than two, and that would be fine. And you could then that would be maybe an, an I feeling that research paper already exists, but that would be an interesting paper, you know, like like studying the effect of um, of number of parents involved in crossover. It gets a little more maybe computationally expensive because you have to say, well, how am I going to efficiently blend from three different ones? Um, and you can imagine maybe there's arithmetic ways to do that that are simple, um, and that's perfectly fine. The canonical or just more <coughs> traditional genetic algorithm is two parents and two offspring, but you are certainly willing or free to go and, and move off in that direction. Any other questions about this? So I mean, like my you know, basic idea here, um, you know, fitness proportion. Like if, as an example, you can kind of think that fitness proportionate is uh, rewards fitness the most, and tournament um, sort of um, rewards it the least. So what, if you were to think about this selection operators in terms of this space, then you can kind of think of it as, as maintaining diversity, genetic diversity. So um, you can say here that um, here, um, you, you, you're you're okay with low genetic diversity, whereas down here, you uh, would prefer high genetic diversity. Sorry for the squeezed space here. Um, but the idea here is if you really want to maintain diversity in your population, so you want to keep things up in the exploration regime, then maybe you should be favoring something like a tournament selection because it's very likely that you will select for recombination uh, parents that may or may not, that may actually not be really high in fitness. But in fitness proportionate selection, if you have parents that even if there's, there's only one, you know, one individual that has a, a much, much, much better fitness than all the others, then you're pretty much saying that they might be very highly uh, likely to get into the next generation. And then there's kind of the blend of those is the ranking ones. And where in the ranking ones you're saying, I still care about fitness so that I want to make sure that every time I make a choice for to the, the parents that I keep in mind all the fitnesses. But the, the gaps in between fitness aren't as important to me, just the ranking is. So this is sort of, you know, main, helps if you're in an, a situation where diversity is important. And uh, when we go into multi-objective genetic optimization, which is basically will be in about you know, two lecture periods, then diversity will be really, really important. And that's why we will add even additional things like niching and stuff like that. But, but you can kind of think about this in terms of maintaining diversity. Um, you know, I mentioned mutation as well. You know, uh, high mutation, I already mentioned what it does versus low mutation. And this, um, even the non-uniform here, basically shifts you your mutation force, kind of the angle here, so that it angles it more towards exploration or more towards exploitation. Question. Yeah, it's a pressure toward, it gets rid of genetic diversity. It gets rid of all diversity. Yeah. On your paper, as a researcher, whether a certain eligible seed fund for integration of uh, parking is a, a winner eligible seed fund for parking based on this type of accumulation? Uh, well, I mean, I think, so this diagram that I drew up here really isn't something specific to evolutionary computing. Um, I would say that the, the, uh, the evolutionary biologists and evolutionary anthropologists um, have a much more sophisticated view of these things. This is me kind of giving you the first steps into that world, where they even have different types of drift and different drift rates and what contributes to all that. So absolutely, you could use this as a conceptual model to start thinking about other processes. And there are people out there that have done that. When we come down to having to build these things, then we often keep it simple, and uh, because it maybe we want provable algorithms, or maybe it's just computationally complex to throw all the, those complications in there. Maybe we just don't really know how to implement those complications. But absolutely, this basic idea 
um, there are three forces that are, are creating tension between each other um, would apply to anything that looks like an evolutionary system. And that could be a cultural evolutionary system as well. All right, so that's basically kind of the, um, where we sort of left off um, in the genetic algorithms. And I mentioned that uh, you can extend the GAs. People have already asked for a number of different ways. You know, we've talked about extensions here. So, and again, the way you would interpret these extensions, I would argue, is in terms of that graph. And so just a couple, and this is not an exhaustive list, but just wanted to get you thinking, is you could vary the uh, crossover and mutation probabilities over time. And you could do that actually with um, you know, other parameters as well. Other, I'll say, hyperparameters as well. And so uh, this, you know, you could even um, make this adaptive in terms of uh, detected selection pressure. And so I posted a paper from 2018 uh, with that summarizes some attempts moving in this direction and then talks about some new ways to potentially do that, where you can basically do, you can have your algorithm do an analysis of the population and then try to come up with some proxy for selection pressure and then say, am I currently applying too much selection pressure or too little? And based on that metric, you could crank up and down things like these parameters. So you might not know how much selection pressure you need for a given fitness function. It might be that in certain parts of the fitness function, you need more selection pressure than others. So as you're moving around, you can constantly look at your uh, population and then make choices about, well, maybe I should crank up mutation right now, maybe I should turn it down. So that's you know, one uh, avenue that you can extend these things. Um, we've had uh, already the question about crossover, how it's a kind of a wonky operator, because you could take a really good solution and another really good solution that are really far away from each other in genotypic space, cross them over, and get offspring that, that don't even make the, the function go, that are completely, you know, it's not infeasible, impractical. And yeah, selection will end up sorting those out, but it's a, it's a big waste to do that. So you know, what you can do is only permit crossover between similar individuals. And so you can you know, think about adjusting that crossover probability based on the pairing. So you could go across all pairings, and if one uh, individual is very similar to another, it's li very likely they'll cross over, at least relatively likely they'll cross over. But if two pairings are not similar at all, we don't even try the crossover with them. And, uh, and so that is sort of a similarity to kind of like creating a concept of species where you could imagine that in your genotypic space, if you had a bunch of individuals that happened to land next to each other, then you might end up maintaining diversity because these individuals would just never cross over with these, so you would never get that interpolating effect of offspring in the middle. And so these would end up playing with each other, and these would end up playing with each other, but these two sandboxes would have like a wall in between them. Yeah. Uh, aren't you losing a lot of potential if you're extending Lose, it? Losing a lot of what? A lot of potential. Yeah, oh, there's a cost, I think. Like, maybe this is a good solution. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so this, th that you pay that cost. So if you are in an application where you notice that your genetic algorithm is really, really slow, and it's slow because it's generating a lot of solutions that get thrown out, then this might be a, a way to tune your GA. But I'm not saying it's always going to be a good idea. Yeah, okay. Okay. You have a question in the back? Sure, I, I think you can, yeah, I mean, that would be one way to extend this, is to make this even more sophisticated, or at least to, to, to think of it, like you say, as kind of an unsupervised clustering, or 
what's going on. Because yeah, you might not know where these species exist, but as the algorithm's going on, whatever this operator that you've put in here will end up generating these clusters. And so you end up getting, um, you know, it's, it, you don't know how many clusters are out there, but you can even fit that. You could say that, um, you know, you, you want there to be three clusters. You could turn this into kind of like a k-means algorithm or something like that. But, um, so there's a bunch of ways you can implement this, but yeah, I think you could probably make a lot of mental uh, analog to clustering. Um, so that maintains diversity and prevents a lot of impossible or feasible options. Um, and then uh, the other thing you could say, well, um, another option is if I just don't want to screw up, if I found some really good options, I just make sure that there's, I don't ever pollute good options until I find an even better option. And that's this idea of elitism, which shows up in a lot of evolutionary algorithms. And uh, I've already talked about that uh, a little bit. And you basically can just say that always ensure that the best solutions, and you can determine what you mean by best. It could be the best two, the best three, or whatever. Uh, make it in to the breeding population. And then you could treat them differently once they're in the breeding population. Okay. So as an example, um, you could say once they're in the breeding population, maybe uh, they're, if they're picked for a crossover, then I don't cross them over because I don't want, uh, I, that way I could just sort of increase their representation as if the children become clones of them. Maybe that's an option you want to do. Maybe they get less, maybe their offspring get less mutation. Uh, you know, those sorts of things. So you could treat them differently or just keep them around. Usually just keeping them around is kind of enough. But then once you find solutions that are better than them, then maybe they then get turned into kind of normal solutions that possibly could just get factored out by selection again. So that's elitism. And then uh, the other uh, opportunity to exploit that I'll mention here is um, uh, variable population size. And again, you can try to think of this maybe in terms of exploration, exploitation. Uh, maybe at certain times you detect that you can tolerate more drift. Maybe at other times you detect that uh, drift is kind of taking over, so you throw in more individuals. Um, so uh, the, the lower the population size, the fewer number of function evaluations you have to do in parallel and the less memory you have to deal with to keep in track of everything but then you can kind of scale that up if you want higher resolution searching. So, um, so these are all things that I think you'll find in the literature already. And I think you could dream up you know, your own. So um, you know, this is like roll your own for the rest of these. Um, you know, GAs have been around for a long time and they're very extensible and pluggable. Uh, later, we will discuss the extension of multi-objective where our fitness function has a divert, well, I would say a multi, I'll do FK here, where you can think of these as K optimization objectives. And uh, the other way to think of it is biologically is a multiple character phenotype. So that's much more realistic in biology. Uh, you might say, well, it's, it's better to run faster, but if running faster comes with a, uh, a loss in something else, that you would also say, all things being equal, it's better to do that. Then you're going to put a tension between these two, and so it's not clear which genotype's better, the fast running one or the one that corresponds to the other, you know, I don't know. Maybe in order to run faster, uh, you get lower manual dexterity because your limbs are longer. And so if dexterity is important, but running fast is important, then how do I decide you know, which genotype to select? And maybe in some problems, one will be favored, in other problems, another will be favored. So how do we encode that into a fitness function? And then how do we maintain diversity so that we can sort of figure out what that trade-off space is if we don't know it ahead of time? So, yeah. Are the objectives the same for all the Um, that's normally, the well, so it kind of depends on how you want to do this, but yeah, th I think that's the simplest way to implement these things, is to think that every individual uh, is expressing itself, is expressing K different traits. 
And so every individual is gonna be measured in terms of that individual's fitness in terms of those k-dimensional trait vectors that comes out. So yeah, every individual has the same set of fitness. Now again, you can get more complicated and get more exotic in the kind of artificial ecologies that you build, but that's the basic idea. And that's something we'll get to again in about two lectures once we get over artificial immune systems and genetic programming, which we'll start on today. So any questions about that? And that's for the last slide until I move on here to the next topic. Hopefully everybody's had some success uh, getting your optimizer. Yeah. Uh, is elitism mean uh, uh, like saving the best uh, separately and like uh, performing the breeding, uh, like continuing the breeding and then uh, pulling that on later stage or something like that? Um, I would say that the simplest way to implement elitism is when you're drawing your R parents, so these are the, the breeding population of R parents, the first thing you do before the normal selection operator is you grab like the three best and you put them in as, and then those, so now you've got R minus three slots to select for. And then you do normal selection to fill out the R. And then you do normal crossover mutation to fill out the M minus R. No, that, that would be kind of a Nash optimal. This is more, we're gonna use the term Pareto optimal for this discussion. So this is for the, the special class of problems that we're looking for a Pareto optimal set or a, a Pareto set or a Pareto frontier. So that's what's gonna come out of here. What you're talking about is when each agent has different objectives, but their objectives are parameterized by the choices of every agent. And so, and that's what we call a Nash optimal. And uh, there are certainly ways that you can solve NASH problems with, uh, with these kind of multi-agent systems. And we'll kind of get to that more towards the end of the semester, um, and where we kind of would turn multiple agents into a parallel numerical solver. But, um, but, yeah, but this, is a, this is different than that. All right. Yeah. Yeah, right, so well, I would say that to me, game theory is a specialization of the broader topic of multi-objective optimization. And so we will start with Pareto optimal, uh, but when we get the multi-agent systems and parallel numerical optimization, then I'll talk about these things called variational inequalities that, that apply to multi-agent systems. And one of the problems that DI solve is uh, Nash optimization. And, and Basically, you can think about if I implement a bunch of robots and each one of them are gradient climbers, um, but their gradients depend upon the choices of the other robots, where are they gonna settle out at? And it turns out that, that the answer to that is also the answer of what is the Nash optimal strategy for all the robots. Okay. All right, so let's move into something um, Initially, that will look completely different, but I'm putting it here because as we write out the algorithm, I hope you'll see the influence of this evolutionary computing framework on the way in which people have thought about these um, uh, immunocomputing. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a whole lot about these immunocomputing, uh, primarily because uh, now at ASU, we have one of the, the leaders in the thinking of immunocomputing, Stephanie Forrest, who teaches a class at the same time as this, and, uh, and so I've always sort of only give kind of a brief overview of this anyway, but now we actually have somebody local that could give you even better answers than I could about this, who not only knows the history, but was part of it. Uh, so, um, so basically, the, what we're starting in this unit two, it's got two parts, adaptive immu or artificial immune systems and genetic programming. We're gonna focus on the artificial immune systems here today, and then we'll get back to genetic programming. They, these are meant to be, what I'm saying, beyond um, optimization examples. So you'll see that they're going to share a lot with genetic algorithms, but the problems that they're solving are not optimization problems. They're design problems, really, but they're, they're almost like creativity problems. So how do we use evolutionary methods to come up with creative solutions? What do we mean by creative solutions? 
And so this first set uh, was inspired by a broader field that people refer to as immunocomputing. And immunocomputing is basically uh, being inspired by how immune systems or immune networks uh, solve information processing problems that are related to or robust to attack, noise, errors, or intrusions. So um, there's a lot of cybersecurity uh, applications here. So how do I detect that a uh, foreign uh, party is in my network? Um, you know, a foreign software agent is in my network, or that I'm being attacked from remote? Or how do I achieve something, even like encrypted communication, in the face of almost certainly being attacked by people trying to eavesdrop on me? Does something looking at the immune system help me when I design these systems? And so that's kind of where they're going to be coming from. They're often inspired by protein-protein interactions uh, in uh, you know, sort of these are sort of skin in, so, so they're not at an evolutionary time scale. Now we're thinking of the time scale of your life history. Uh, so you know, as you're you're up and running, so what's going on underneath the skin as you've got these protein networks that have to function to keep you running, but also have to deal with the fact that they're almost certainly being attacked as they're moving. And so uh, the focus uh, here for the day is on. Um, the AIS, and it's a little unfortunate that they use this initialism because in, uh, in biology, AIS specifically means the, um, the ad adaptive immune system, which I'm about to define here. Uh, and so we've got two things that are involved in immune systems, but different, but and there, there's uh, effectively this artificial immune system is what we're talking about today is primarily inspired by the adaptive immune system, but it's kind of unfortunate they just used the same initialism but a different word. So, uh, so that gets a little confusing sometimes, like whether we're in the biological context or the artificial context, but uh, the AIS is the artificial immune system. And an artificial immune system is primarily inspired by this thing called the adaptive immune system. But you can see people borrowing a little bit from these two different immune systems. And so let's just give you some background. So there's basically two types of immune system in vertebrates. And a vertebrate. Um, yeah, it's just a, it's a, it's a taxonomic group that includes us, things that have spines. Uh, yeah, so those things that have bones on the inside. And so uh, there's the so-called innate immune system. And this is one that doesn't get as much attention because it's difficult to study. Because if your body is working properly, you don't really notice it. So the, uh, the innate immune system is called innate because it's also present in plants, fungi, uh, and invertebrates. So it's old. It's evolutionary old. So uh, I'll say it's evolutionarily old. Innate. It's what uh, you know. It's what came first, and we all still have it. But then vertebrates happen to also get this additional thing, which I'll talk about here in a second. This here is what basically keeps your temperature at roughly 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit uh, all the time, and then what causes you to get a fever when you have an infection. So this is something which is responsible for your inflammatory response. So you can imagine this is recruitment to an infection, or so I got a cut, it's got infected, I get a recruitment to there, it gets all red and puffy, uh, and then gradually it heals, and once it heals, it stops being red and puffy anymore. So it's that red and puffiness, that is that what I call it, inflammatory response. Um, I got a fever, uh, I have a fever there, um, gradually that kills off whatever the pathogen was, 
and then I lose my fever and I go back to normal. So most of the time, your skin is, you know, doesn't have you know, big red puffy spots. Most of the time, you don't have a fever. Most of the time, this, this system really is in homeostasis and it's usually sitting at its set point. So it's difficult to study. And so we don't have a lot of you know, exciting uh, examples to be inspired by because we just don't have as many exciting examples of this because it's kind of difficult to study in continuity. Um, so, uh, you know, you can think of the failure response and maybe removal of foreign substances is another thing. The fact that you have a skin covering your whole body is actually an artifact of the innate immune system. So the innate immune system is trying to keep out foreign substances from the really important parts of your physiology, and the simplest way to do that is to cover yourself with a membrane. And so that is actually considered part of the innate immune system. It's like the boring part of the immune system. Um, so this is a generic response. So if your body detects there's something weird going on, it gets a fever. It's, it's, um, it, it can be triggered uh, you know, uh, with, in error. So you can get a fever for reasons that you shouldn't get a fever. And so it's not specific to anything in particular. It's a generic response. Your body detects something wrong, and it triggers into these uh, transient states, which hopefully then go away over time. So the other side of that, the thing that is this so-called adaptive, or acquired, or specific. These are all different terms for the same thing, immune system. And I'll highlight that specific there. Um, so this is something that evolved in, verte in vertebrates, although now it looks like there is a parallel system that may have evolved, it may have evolved in invertebrates but we just only know what, how to look for ours. We don't know how to look for theirs. And so it kind of makes sense that they would have some of this. But the key characteristic behind this is, and this is kind of the cool information processing thing, is an immunological memory. So this is the thing that when you get a vaccine, you trigger. So this, this is something that you, if you survive infection for long enough, then your body internally does a stochastic search for the best response to that infection in the future while it has a sample of it, and it remembers that response so that if you're later infected by it, you can immediately trigger that response. And that's what you mean by immunological memory. Yeah. Is this time dependent? Uh, what do you mean by time dependent? So like, let's say it remembers stochastic still remember that? Well, I think that it's hard for it to, I don't want to be too generic, but that's the, the basic idea is that, um, and then you know, certain things, this is why you need booster shot for certain vaccines. So setting the kind of time scale of how long you're project, is protected is a complicated thing. But that's the basic idea. The major difference between number two and number one here is that there is no memory. This, you're born with this, this is just how it happens. It doesn't really tweak itself over time. But this one builds up memory over time. Um, and so, and it builds up specific memory. So, it, it, and so it, it's, it's able to initially have zero response to a cold, but then after you have a particular strain of a cold, then the next time it's able to kick into gear because it remembers the signature of that cold. So it's highly specific. And that's where we, it's called the specific immune system. And that's what inspired computer scientists to start looking into this, because it's pretty cool that you have this physiological system that we normally think of in terms of its high fidelity ability to copy itself you know, over evolutionary scale, somehow internally is able to search over a huge space of possible pathogens and remember the signature of a particular one and trigger a response later and do that in a memory that may not even be able to be transferred to offspring. So it's clearly a local process. It's not like a hidden program that was in your genes. 
This is going on post-transcription. Well, I don't want to say that. This is going on uh, sort of at your life history, not at your evolutionary history. And um, so that's pretty cool. And so that's what we're trying to mimic. Now, uh, the people who study this know that this all happens through this thing called, it's, high, it's highly adaptable. And that's due to something, a mechanism that they refer to as somatic hypermutation. And the particular mechanism is something called VDJ recombination. And I'm not going to get into a whole lot of details here, but I just want to give you a flavor of what is the basic mechanism that's going on here. Um, so somatic is body tissue. So uh, this is like, you know, as cells divide, they have to put themselves back together. They have to copy genes and then put themselves back together into two cells that have copies of those genes. Well, there are special cells in your immune system that when they divide, they're able to then do recombination, and that's what this recomb here, which normally you would only think of happening within sex between two different individuals. But this is going on inside, among cells, and it's not just your normal recombination, it's this special recombination where this is like variable uh, joining diversity. So basically you can take a string, a sequence, and you can recombine it with another sequence in a bunch of different ways. And by resorting that sequence, this is like the pseudo random number generator of the immune system. So it's not capitalizing on, so yeah, I mean, just, I mean, just think about this for a second, like down to the mechanism level. Like if you wanted to mutate a part of you, if you wanted to create variation inside of you, try to imagine like you're, you are, you know, synthetic biology trying to generate variation. How do you do that? You can't depend on cosmic rays or anything like that because you have to do it fast enough. So nature has invented their own version of a PRNG by using these, these sequences that they're able to chop up. So they use a little bit of randomness that you can find within the cell biology to chop up a sequence which itself is highly variable in a number of different ways that when you reassemble it, you're almost guaranteed to get a wildly different sequence. And so this is, again, the pseudo-random number generator of the immune system. And this is capitalized on to bias the system toward uh, exploration. So this biases toward exploration. And what are you exploring for? You are trying to uh, build antibodies which fit antigens. So basically, when you have a pathogen coming in, it's going to have pieces of itself which bind to your body and make you <coughs> sick. And those pieces of itself are unique to themselves. So the reason they're making you sick is that they shouldn't be there, and so they should hopefully be things that you can use to spot those things. Now, if you could just find antibodies that would bind to them instead, then you prevent them from doing damage. And if those antibodies have a flag on them that can recruit other parts of your body that can eat them, basically, then you have a way of getting rid of these things. But you need to create the antibodies that can float around and match to the antigens. So your body is using this fancy pseudorandom number generator, VDJ recombination, to generate a whole bunch of antibodies constantly. And hopefully, because you're in the exploration space, you'll be infected for long enough. In other words, you'll survive for long enough. Because remember, speed accuracy trade-off. If you crank up mutation, if you sit in that exploration space, it's gonna take you a long time to settle down. Uh, but you at least have a chance of finding something. So here we've cranked up the mutation rate. It's not really mutation, but the variation rate here in order to find these antigens. And once you find them, you can store them in immunological memory so you don't have to do this ever again. So that's what's going on inside your adaptive or acquired immune system. So it's finding specific keys to locks that are introduced from remote. And that's what we're trying to be inspired by. So questions about that basic idea before I go into 
um, an example of how you might um, build an algorithm that acts like this. Yeah. So do you get users in N40? Right. And how about the N20? Those are introduced from outside. This is the what you get. What gets you sick? They're inside. The, they're on the pathogen that you get infected with. Okay. So like that's kind of the code that we get from some kind of an agent that's trying to affect the system. Right. So the antigen might be. So that's good. You know, an application example might be that. Um, and so uh, I get to the second example here, and that might be more clear. But this idea that there's a a, a pattern. So you notice that, like, let's say you've got a, a packet sniffer on a network. And you notice that normally, the normal network traffic, people accessing Google Drive, whatever, all that, has certain patterns. But occasionally, you notice that there's a weird pattern of activity. And that weird pattern activity, you don't know what it is, but it's not normal. And you might then say, I want to take that weird pattern activity, find out where it's from, and then maybe end up detecting, maybe I'm, I'm getting an attack at that point. So the antigen is sort of like the signature of the attack. Or it might be, let's say you've got a computer virus on your, your machine and you're scanning through the memory and there's sort of normal patterns that you'd see up in RAM, but then there's a couple of other patterns that you're not, are kind of abnormal, but you can't identify what they are. They might just be junk because you know somebody allocated memory and deallocated and whatever, and that's just the random junk that's there from computers using memory. But there could be something stored in there that periodically gets executed, and you'd like to identify that, oh, there's structure here. That's not just junk. So that's like the antigen. So you don't want your antibodies responding to everything, but you want them responding to the specific things that cause a problem. Yeah? So just so I'm having this clear in my head, bias room both the antigen to the nature of the attack as well as the appropriate response to antibody therapy. Well, what, what happens here is, uh, so I'm, I'm leaving out a lot of details here, but the innate immune system can trigger the adaptive immune system. So you can actually detect that there's something going wrong. And at that point, it can launch your adaptive immune system into high gear to go searching. So you're not necessarily searching all the time. Sometimes you have to detect that you're in an infected state. And then while you've got that fever, then uh, your adaptive immune system is looking for keys to locks that it happens to find. And once it finds them, hopefully that helps you clear. So, uh, but this is, it's much more complicated. People with their whole careers in just one or the, uh, one, two, or the interface of these. But that's the basic idea. All right, so let's get an example of that. So. Um, so there are clonal selection algorithms. This is sort of, there's there kind of two major categories of adaptive immune system, artificial immune systems. Um, and our first example is called clonal selection, not clonal. And so the um, idea here is I'm given an input. So given an input set, I'll call it S, of, um, I'll call them antigens. But you can think of this here as these are known signatures of attackers, intruders, viruses, whatever you'd like. These are signatures that uh, are out there. And I need to find, um, now, when I say signatures, these might not be as simple as, uh, as you know, strings of code. Like, these might be things that actually require you to do something interesting in order to reveal. What I mean by that is, like, in order for me to tell that a computer is infected, I, it may not be as simple as me just looking at a particular region of memory. I might need to uh, tap out a particular key combination, and if I get a particular response, it, then that response that I get indicates whether I'm infected or not. So there might be a certain diagnostic that I need to do in order to end up, um, in, in order to detect that I've got that infection. So you can imagine that my set of antigens might be a set of computers that are known to be infected with this, uh, this virus, for example. And I'm now looking for a set of diagnostic tools that will end up detecting the infection. So the output that I would like to produce is a set which I'll call M 
um, of the, I'm gonna call them memory B cells, but um, just because to make it sound like this acquired immune system, these are related to those antibodies. But you could basically think this is a set of diagnostics that uh, have a good ability to detect those antigens, to bind to those antigens. And so uh, how would I design such an algorithm? So that's the structure of the algorithm. And so my first step might be to generate a random <coughs> set M of these B cells. generate a random one. And then, uh, so that's my initial population. So I'm hoping you'll see that there's going to be a link here between this and the genetic algorithms, that process we have in mind here. And then I basically say for all, or I guess I'll say for any, or for each, I'll say for each, antigen, lowercase ag in my set of antigens, I perform this um, algorithm. I calculate the affinity of all of the, um, these B cells to the uh, antigen. So I go through each one of my random, my M set here, and I calculate how well do they stick to the antigen. And by how well do they stick to the antigen, I, it's sort of like um, thinking about a classification like a, a receiver operating characteristic. It's, it's like how well, what is, uh, how well do they detect that the antigen is there? So uh, calculate an affinity for, I'll say of all B cells or of all M to this particular AG. And we can think of this, yeah. So when you say calculate affinity, are you implying the existence of some substance that takes a B cell and an antigen and returns an affinity? Yeah, I'm, I'm saying that there is some process. So we can call it a function, but we can call it some sort of process that allows me to evaluate how well this particular solution inside here matches to this particular antigen. So we're gonna so it's possible that we have different kinds of antigens within different like multiple different kinds of B cells and we match them. Is that is that why it's like that would that would that would draw? Uh, well I mean so we are gonna have different I mean there's different um, types of antigens in this set so there's different challenges. Mm -hmm. So we have a diverse array of challenges and it's kind of a multi-objective optimization problem here. So I have a diverse array of challenges. I have a limited set of detection methods. So I am trying to optimize this set of detection methods that ensures that I can detect as many in my challenge set as possible. But I realize that um, as I get rid of some of the things in M, I may actually get rid of the ability to detect some of the things in S. And so, yeah. Uh -huh. So that random set of M, that's like your initial population of AG, right? That's right. So you can think of this as an initial population, and you can think of this as calculating a fitness surrogate. So this is kind of like fitness. And so given that it's um, fitness, then we need some sort of selection. And you know, so this will be clonal selection. So by clonal selection, we said that the R parents are kind of like clonally selected in the GA. They, uh, the, the M minus R are the ones that go through recombination. So clonal selection basically is gonna mean that inside this for loop, it's gonna look a little bit like a genetic algorithm without recombination, but it's gonna have all the other features. So we select the highest affinity B cells and we then do proportional cloning and we place the clones 
in a set I'll call C for now. And then for all of the clones in C, so we do that, and then so Python like I'll back out the indent here. So then for all clones in C, then I will mutate, and here's where it gets a little exciting. Um, I'm going to mutate each of them at a rate that's inversely proportional to their affinity. So inversely <coughs> proportional So this is like, you know, one of these kooky uh, mutation operators that you could implement yourself in a GA. Here we're basically saying um, if it's got a really high affinity for this antigen, um, then I want to leave it alone. It's pretty good. But if it's, but if um, I have a clone that performs well relative to all the others, but has a pretty low match to my antigen, then I'm going to mutate it a lot. So it's a way for me to mutate the offspring based on their match for this particular um, antigen. And then after that, I copy all clones into my um, set B. This is the new set B. And then I copy the highest affinity clones into my set M, and then I replace the lowest affinity B cells with randomly generated alternatives. And you can fix population size and all this process uh, however, um, however you'd like. So you can imagine there being a fixed population, a fixed number of outputs here that you're maintaining through this whole thing. And you've got these other sets that you generate and you select for to keep that population size uh, fixed. Yeah. Uh, this is mutate each at a rate inversely proportional to affinity. And then copy all the clones into B, copy the highest affinity from B into M, and then replace the lowest affinity ones from your B set with some randomly generated ones. So that would be a way. And if you, we sort of want to think about uh, this, then I said this is fitness. And you can think of this as the mating pool, but they're clonally, so we're, um, we've got cloning going on, not crossover. Not crossover. And then we have mutation, as in the GA, and then we have our new population as in the GA. And then we can iterate through all of this. So this is uh, one method of, uh, you know, of, of these adaptive immune systems, which I think you can see as the, the, the spirit of it clearly borrows a lot from the structure of the evolutionary algorithms that came 10, 15 years before it. Yeah. So then the only way you're Improving generation to generation is through mutation. Uh, well, because of the cloning, uh, yeah, you've got this. Yeah, that was that's sort of the idea here is that um, we. It's kind of like when I mentioned that the crossover, you can create wonky solutions. So the idea here is there's so much specificity that if we've got something that's good, it's probably a bad idea to cross it with something else that's good. Um, so this is a particular case where crossover probably has no value, which is why they've removed it and just allowed them to mutate. And really, the mutation only happens on those that aren't really doing that well. Yeah. Wouldn't this take a long time then if you're only using mutation to improve? Yeah, well, I mean, that's the kind of the thing. These things, these stochastic searches, I, 
I mean, they are kind of depending on luck and running a long time or running continuously. So that kind of brings, we'll see that even more in this second one. Does it only depend on rotation? Because I can see that in the cloning step, you're doing proportional cloning, right? So well, it's true that, that, um, that, that there's the ones that do well are going to get higher representation. We keep them around. But the variation is only going to come from the mutation. So that's our only source of variation is this mutation. All right, well, let me then cover the other half of this so we can wrap out this. This, this next algorithm for adaptive immune system is very short. Um, so the second example is um, otherwise known as negative selection. And there are, again, a variety of clonal selection algorithms and a variety of negative selection algorithms. And this is the, the family of algorithms that is largely attributed to Dr. Porus in, um, in her work. And so this you can think as a threat detection algorithm. And I can sort of specify this at a very high level. And so the idea here is I generate random strings. And then rather than cloning ones that work well, I remove ones that I know match things that I'm already familiar with as being good. So eliminate recognizable self strings. And then that is going to then leave you with a big set of things that you've identified as being weird. And so if you just keep that around and you happen to notice any code or any other network signatures that match anything that's left over, then you can have some confidence that that thing probably doesn't belong there. And so you flag that. So then um, during operation, you can flag um, any future encountered signature. And this might be code, for example, in memory that um, is in the uh, set. So you generate random stuff, you remove anything that you recognize, and anything that's left over becomes a template for detecting things that shouldn't be there. And so that's the basics behind negative selection. So you can see that there's two different ways that you're basically trying to generate creativity in recognition systems. In one way, you randomly search through spaces, finding things that recognize known bad things. Um, in another way, you randomly search through the space, eliminating things that are known good things, and then take whatever's left over and treat that as your signature. Yeah. So every time your good system changes, you have to update the potential bad things. Well, yeah, it's kind of like um, here, this could generate false positives as the system yeah. goes on, and then you can just adjust this set. Gotcha, so you just run it again and, and rebuild it out. Right, and I, I'm overly simplifying, but yeah, it's basically <coughs> this, this idea is that you've got a vocabulary or a, a, yeah, just a, 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 a set of signatures that, and I say flag, so you probably don't want to take um, you know, a, too much you know, the crazy action here, but you at least then flag it. And then when that gets flagged, then that provides an opportunity for a human to come in and promote that string up or actually then take action. Yeah. So the main thing is what's possible when you conflict the interest is to be involved with some kind of memory problem that that could uh, ask myself to uh, do this mostly with the memory part. Of well, the memory part is this set of strings. Set of strings. And so right now, um, what we're doing is sort of we have a background set of strings and our memory are the strings that aren't there. As opposed to the previous one in clonal selection, our memory are the strings that are there. So here we're adjusting the background and the holes in the background are like the representation of the memory of the immune system um, where you're, mem you're remembering self. And um, in the other one, it's not the holes in the background, it's the... Um, it's the actual set that um, that you that you generate. 
But in either way, you're, you're basically, both of them use variation uh, in order to, I mean, they, they, it's kind of like the VDJ cells generate a whole lot of variation in an effort to match things that shouldn't be there. And one of them is specifically looking for ways to only catch things that shouldn't be there. And the other one, we're saying we're gonna look for everything that should be there and then everything else shouldn't be there. So both of them are generating a way to capture things that aren't there, but in one you've got known bad and the other one you've got known good. All right, any other? And then the hope, I guess, with the clonal selection is that if you get a, a nice set of antigens here, then maybe some of your solutions for one antigen will be halfway decent for another one, because maybe um, you know, one virus will end up getting um, you know, cloned in like the get clone way you know, by somebody else, modified a little bit, but will still have a very similar signature. All right, so those are our artificial immune systems. Are there questions about, about that? I don't want to talk too much about them, but I just want to try to highlight the similarities between artificial immune systems and genetic algorithms. And it's a way to take this evolutionary thinking and stretch it for your application area. So these are, these are only loosely thought of as optimization problems, finding the optimal response to you know, certain challenges. Uh, but, um, but I think especially in the case of clonal selection, it clearly is borrowing a lot from the GA. All right, well, so next time I'll start on genetic programming where the idea there is how do I build the optimal code base? And so a lot of that is innovating in the way in which you encode code so that you could use it in a genetic algorithm. So we're, we're back to optimization, but we're not optimizing like finding a, 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 a decision variable that optimizes a function. We're actually finding code. And so we're letting the computer program write the program for us in order to find the optimal way to solve a particular problem or solve a particular problem better. And uh, so we'll show how you can encode programming into the genetic algorithm next time. And with that, that's all I've got for you today.